Where I live in Santa Cruz, California, the sound of rain is a memory or a sound effect. Cut. We've had four years of drought. This coming winter, it's supposed to be wet. That would be fabulous. But the long-term forecast is for the southwestern U.S. to get even drier. Water rationing started here in May. A lot of people have stopped watering lawns and let them die or replace them with drought-tolerant plants. We wash vegetables over containers. People keep a tub in the shower to catch water while it's getting hot to water their yards with. That's a close-up view. But what if we zoom out? What bigger principles can we see in action? I'll share four that I see. They're all described in Eyes Wide Open. I know they apply to the drought. You'll see them in action in lots of other issues as well. Enough chocolate cake on the table for everyone to have seconds? Everyone's happy. Only enough for some of the table? Everyone's fighting. What's jumped out at me is how quickly scarcity brings conflict. When the state asked for voluntary cutbacks in 2014, right away California broke up into warring camps. First, there's the North versus the South. Since most of the rain falls in the North, Northerners resent the South for using more water than nature's given them. They dislike the canals and pipelines that take water south to those pools and golf courses. No wonder Northern Californians hate the Dodgers. When voluntary cuts went into place, the South did a poorer job of conserving, and this fanned the fairness issue. People only want to make cuts if everyone's making cuts. Scarcity causes conflict, and unfairness worsens it. Then there's the rich versus the poor. Some wealthy areas with huge yards turned out to use way more water than poorer towns nearby. Check out this map. 76 gallons per person per day in South San Francisco, but 334 in affluent Hillsboro, almost next door. And then there's Palm Springs with an incredible 736. Westerners roll their eyes at the artificial ski slopes in the Middle Eastern country, Dubai. The golf courses in Palm Springs, kind of the same thing. Some wealthy areas also found legal loopholes that would let them avoid meters and cuts and higher water bills. Let's not forget agriculture versus households. Farms use 80% of water, but the focus of conservation always seems to be on residents. This blew up when it came to light that many Central Valley farmers had never installed meters. When they were required to do so and to report how much water they were pumping, many just didn't. And then came their offer to cut back 25% only if the state would never ask them to cut back more. The issue again, fairness. Scarcity leads to outright stealing. Water has been stolen from fire hydrants, private water tanks, lakes, reservoirs. The actor Tom Selleck got caught taking water from a neighboring district for his ranch. Combine the fairness issue with a cell phone camera, and what do you get? Drought shaming. Photos and videos of water wasters, typically posted with their addresses. The rich and famous are favorite targets. The Puritans used to put people in the stocks to publicly shame them for their crimes. Drought shaming is the digital version. If you've got your own private lake on your property, you probably wouldn't want to catch every single fish in it. You'd probably want to leave some so they could reproduce and you'd have fish to catch every summer. But let's say the lake is public and there's 10 other houses on it and you see all of your neighbors out there catching as many fish as they can as fast as they can. Well, then you'd be motivated to do the same thing, even if it's bad in the long term, because otherwise you'd be getting less than them. The situation with a shared resource is known as the tragedy of the commons. It's led to extinctions and the crash of fish populations. What's the connection with the drought? Well, rainfall seeps into underground aquifers. With less rain and snow falling on California, we're getting less of our water from rivers and more from aquifers via pumps. Are we taking only what nature replenishes each year? Are you crazy? Instead, we're staging a new production of the tragedy of the commons. We're pumping so much water that land is actually sinking. People's wells have dried up. Near the coast, farmers have lowered the water table so much that salt water is coming in, making the water unusable for irrigation. What's the solution to the tragedy of the commons? The parties involved give up their right to do whatever they want and agree on rules that protect the resource's long-term health, something we've largely accomplished with the hunting of whales, and also with the biggest shared resource of all, the atmosphere, back when nations acted to protect the ozone layer in the 1980s. We're now beginning to see this applied to aquifers, not just in California, 
and not only to protect them from overpumping, but from pollution from toxic chemicals used in oil drilling and fracking. We assume technology can get us out of any fix. Can it do it with a drought? Our usual response to scarcity is to increase supply so we don't have to cut back on consumption. But water is different. You can't easily find more or make more. So cutting demand is actually the first choice here, an unusual situation. Cutting back has two big advantages. It's free, and you can put it in place immediately. The problem is that people don't like using less of something than they're used to, and governments don't like asking them to. It's easier to change gadgets than people's lifestyles and expectations, which is why we're seeing two technological fixes for the drought that would indeed increase supply. The first, desalinating seawater. No scarcity there. The downsides? Desal is enormously expensive. You don't need it in years when the rain does fall. There's the problem of the concentrated brine it releases. And it's energy intensive. Ironic since fossil fuel based energy has most likely brought us the climate change that's bringing us the drought. But humans are strongly focused on the present. And the lure of a short term solution to water scarcity is so great that we're willing to ignore the long term problems which is why lots of coastal cities are considering desal. The second fix is much cheaper, recycling water. Wastewater from storm drains and sewers that's normally treated and released will get extra treatment, making it safe for irrigation and drinking. This is already being done in Orange County and other places. The downside in this case, psychology. Getting past the phrase toilet to tap will be a hurdle for some people. The last phenomenon is one you'll see in lots of environmental issues. The crucial information that alerts us to a problem is out of sight. Sights are dominant sense. The problem? You can't tell by looking that almonds take a huge amount of water. So much that California's almond crop actually uses more water than Los Angeles and San Francisco combined. The same goes for meat. Plants need water. And because meat animals have to eat a lot of plants to produce a little meat, meat has a big water footprint especially if the animal is big and takes longer to produce the desired amount of meat. Where else is water invisible? In our electricity. According to one study, the average American home uses five times as much water to make its electricity as it does for showers and other household uses, nearly 40,000 gallons a month. That invisible water is used to cool power plants. It's used in mining operations. It's used to open up fissures in rock to release natural gas and fracking. Coal and nuclear power use the most. There's lots of invisible water in our clothes. Cotton is especially thirsty. It takes 700 gallons to make the average t-shirt. The good news about water? In some places, the water problem is quite easy to see. And then, seeing is believing works in our favor. When you drive past a reservoir whose level is clearly far below normal, the problem is obvious the way it isn't for CO2 in the air. This is Lexington Reservoir, passed by thousands of Santa Cruzans traveling to Silicon Valley every day. Here's San Luis Reservoir, an hour away. Views like these and the sight of dead lawns and Decembers and Januarys without rain make the problem undeniable, which is why the drought has actually been a boon to awareness. The environment's out of sight most of the time for most of the public. When people list the issues they're concerned about, it usually comes in last, if it's there at all. But a drought turns that upside down. Instead of a frill, the environment is suddenly seen for what it is, the foundation of life. The drought forces us to zoom out and realize what's normally ignored, that water coming out of the tap comes from somewhere, a river, an aquifer, a reservoir, and ultimately from the skies and our climate. People start to recognize that they don't live in Walmart, where the shelves are magically restocked. We live on Earth, where stocks are limited. You wouldn't know that from advertising. Ads lead you to think that there's no limit to consumption other than your bank balance. And if that's a problem, use a credit card. A drought tells us the truth. There are limits, and we need to find ways to live within them. It's a great teacher. Are we getting the lesson? Stay tuned, and keep your eyes open.